Hi, welcome to the North and Latin American Chapters Online Town Hall. I'm Stuart Schaefer, Chair of the PNG Alumni Network Cincinnati Chapter. We're on the first wave of public appearances and articles planned for the launch of the book Here Forever about the late John Smale, PNG's CEO and Chairman and Chairman of General Motors. John Smale was a revolutionary leader that was many years ahead of his time. Tonight, we will review much of what made him a great leader. We'll start by screening video highlights of an interview with John Pepper, former P&G CEO chairman and chairman of the Walt Disney Company, and Rob Garver, the author of the book. The highlights are from a town hall hosted by the Cincinnati chapter last month. Then we'll have time for live Q&A. Both John and Rob are online and looking forward to your questions. Throughout the event, we'll be sharing tips in the chat box, and you can post questions there for John and Rob. I hope you're as excited as we are to bring this town hall to you. Now a word from our chair of the PNG Network Worldwide, Ed Tazia. Ed? Thank you, Stuart, and allow me to add my welcome to this town hall. I wanna thank the Cincinnati chapter for hosting this global network event. Many, if not most alumni did not have the opportunity to know or work for John Smale. For many, he's a name on the GEO Auditorium. For me, he was the CEO when I was with the company. For some, reading a biography is all about knowing the person, and Rob Garver's book certainly does that well. But I believe the real value in this book is that it will allow you all to better understand the company of which you are a part. It tells the story of how John Smale learned from the people who took this from a family business to a great American institution. And then John, using the values and principles he learned, took it to a truly global enterprise. Those of you who are participating around the world have John Smale to thank for Procter & Gamble being in your country, being in the range of businesses in which the company thrives, having so many brands that grew to dominance on his watch. For me, this is much more than a biography of a single man. It's a story about a truly unique company and the journey that got it to where it is. I urge you to enjoy this book and share it with everybody you know. Stuart, thanks again. It is my pleasure to host this conversation tonight with John Pepper and Rob Garver as we celebrate the launch of Rob's book. This is a special moment for all PNG alumni because John Smale represents things that we all hold dear. He embodied the, the purpose, values, and principles of PNG. He actually, in fact, was an author of them along with John Pepper. Um, and he, he played a huge role in the company that PNG is today. So reading this book to me was a reminder of the power of PNG as an institution. It's the story of a great man who loved his company and he understood that he was part of something bigger than himself. It really struck me that John Smale appreciated the enormous importance of stewardship as a leader. He believed that it was a responsibility and he was a steward for the brand and the company. Um, and he needed to leave it stronger than he found it. And that's what he, he saw himself truly as a steward. There, the, the lack of ego in that, I think, really struck me as someone who you know, works with leaders today. We're living in a time when public trust in our institutions continues to decline. Young people are questioning the role of work in their lives. They're, they want more from their job than a paycheck. They want a purpose. And there were, were so many ways in this book that John led that feel like they would be relevant today that people hunger for. We're gonna explore those tonight. Purpose is something that John believed in and he spent his whole career and life pursuing. The book that is being released today began four years ago. Kathy Caldmeyer, John Smale's daughter, wanted to ensure that her dad's legacy was preserved for future generations and leaders who didn't even have the chance to know him. That's someone like me. I discovered John through this book as well. And John Pepper signed on to this mission with real passion. Um, he says that John Smale influenced him more than any other leader and that he knows many, many leaders. I think we can say that. Um, 
Kathy and John recruited Rob to capture the essence of John Smale's life. Rob's a journalist. Um, he's worked side by side with Bob Woodward. He has contributed to a broad range of work in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial, the Fiscal Times, I'm sorry. And this book has been, it can only be described as a journey. Um, Rob had never, I, I like this, I mean, Rob had never heard of John Smale when he was recruited to write the book. And as a journalist, he was a bit skeptical. He went searching for the dirt in the underbelly of John's career. And for the record, he couldn't find any. Um, but <laughs> very PNG. Uh, but along the way of his writing, he came to appreciate that John was not just an iconic business leader, but someone who could say something to Rob and teach him lessons as he navigated a difficult time in his own life. So tonight we're gonna discover John Smale together. Thank you for joining us. So, John, I would like to start with you. You knew John Smale better than maybe anyone. Tell us why this book and why now. Before I address that, turn on this. Um, before, before I answer that question, and you may need to bring it back to it, I just want to say a few things. You've had I think John would be pleased that we're launching this book publicly with the Alumni Network. Uh, I know he'd be pleased. This is family to him. He would love to be here and see friends he had over all those years. He, they had a convening in London. He, with the greatest effort, go there to do that. Book and why now? Why is the book important? You know, this is the culmination of a dream of 10 years for me. When John passed away 11 years ago, I dreamed, I didn't know how it would happen, that we would find a way to bring his life and what he stood for and his character and what he did to generations, some of whom then knew him, most today in Procter & Gamble won't know him. So the dream, the hope was that we would find a way to convey that character and what he did. Uh, why I think it's important goes back to a lot of what you said, Meredith. Um, I don't need to tell any of us, we all know, trust in institutions and in people today in this country, if it's not at a rock bottom low, I haven't seen it as low in my lifetime. Now, it's not the first time we've been challenged as a nation in terms of having trust in people, trust in the institutions, but I don't care what it is, media, government, you name it, statistically, trust levels are way down. And it seems to me all of us seek bastions of trust. What can we trust? We start with our family, first and foremost, our family, always. But what else can we have trust in? And I believe, I've, I believe deeply, and I believe probably all of you believe deeply, I have trust in Procter & Gamble and what it stands for. And then when you come to people, who do you have trust in? Who do you know they will not vary from the character you hold dear, from the values you hold dear, in a tough way, but in a human way, in a caring way? And that was John Smale. So I think people who are looking for role models, and we all do, all of you read history, I read history, why do I read history? To find things that I hopefully we can repeat and things we dare not do again, but you read history for heroes to read history for heroes. I don't know if it's George Marshall, Abraham Lincoln, Harriet Tubman, they all have their own, but we look for heroes. And I think, as you'll read in that book, not just for me up here, what I say here isn't that important, uh, but John Smale was a hero to countless people. That was the discovery of the book I might come back to. So I think it's a book for our times. I think it addresses a need that exists of sources for trust, of character, of a whole life, a whole life, and what does it take? There are a couple of things I'll read here um, because I think they bear, bring out this concept, this belief, deep-seated belief in stewardship. Stewardship. John, in every living bone of his body, was committed to sustaining Procter & Gamble successfully and based on the values that made the company 
what it was and what he loved. I'll read you a couple of quotes. These are quotes from John. I believe the fundamental responsibility of this management is the successful perpetuation of this institution. Managers and directors will come and go. Shareholders will change. Certainly the world in which we exist will change. We'll have good years of business growth and some that won't be so good. The things that must not change are the basic principles of this company. Those precepts are articulated in our statement of purpose. By following those principles, the company has grown and its employees and its shareholders have profited more. One more that says, obviously far better than I ever could try to repeat. All institutions have a soul. If they're worth anything, they have a soul. They represent a character. They have an ethos. They perpetuate themselves if they're really well grounded in their character. They don't depend on the personality of a given leader at a given point in time. They go through decades or generations of leaders and they do well. I think primarily because they have that as a foundation, a character that allows people, encourages people to really dedicate a working life to them a life that they believe is worthy of their best values. They're dedicated to the fortunes of the company. They feel badly when the company doesn't do well, and they feel great when the company does do well. Doesn't that say it the way we experienced it? Isn't that what any great institution, whether it be a university or a hospital or a company, seeks to do? But it's not easy. Never happens, as John said in another quote I won't get into here, it never happens just because there's some momentum. It happens only because people are there, committed to learn, overcome mistakes, learn from mistakes. Well, that's a bit of why I'm glad this is happening. I hope, you know, you're kind of on the front line of spreading the word. You're here tonight. And I hope you enjoy this book and are informed and most above all inspired by it, as thus those of us who've had the chance to not read just one draft, but three or four drafts, <laughs> and that you will get the word out about it to your friends and promote it so more people will see it and will be benefited from it. Thank you, John, and thank you for sharing those. Yes, that's worthy of applause. Thank you. Well, let's turn a little bit to process and talk to Rob and, and hear a little bit about his story. So you came into this cold. You didn't know John Smale. You had a natural skepticism as a journalist of CEOs and big business. So what convinced you to take on this really big project? Uh, before I answer that, let me just say that I would not, upon my worst enemy, wish uh, that they follow John Pepper in speaking to a PNG audience. <laughs> That said, um, so yes, I did come to this uh, without a whole lot of background knowledge uh, about John Smale, um, but uh, you asked why I took the project. Uh, on a superficial level, um, uh, okay, right, sorry. On a superficial level, uh, I, I came to this as a journalist, and if you come from that tradition, what you want is to be the first one to tell a story or barring that, to be the first one to tell it from a particular perspective. So it was pretty clear for me to the start that there were great stories here. Uh, just to pick a few, Smales, uh, the, the success with, with Crest Toothpaste as such a young man, the uh, enormous growth of Procter & Gamble uh, under his leadership, the, the turnaround uh, that he executed at General Motors, any one of those things by themselves is a great story. String them together, you've got a fantastic narrative that uh, just by itself would, would make for a, a good book. But as I did more research um, and dug a little deeper, I became convinced that uh, his career um, deserved to be remembered. And, and it wasn't for what I came to think of as the, the headline elements of his, uh, of his tenure at, at P&G and GM. 
it was, uh, as Meredith has mentioned, it was, it was the way he led, um, which is to say, as a steward, as someone who believed that the company he was running, and I think he felt this about both P&G and GM, was something much, much larger than him that deserved to be perpetuated. That was the word that he used. I'm not sure if you quoted that, but, but perpetuated. And, and think about what that means. That, that ties into the book, perpetual, forever. He intended these things to, to be there forever. Um, and uh, it just, it, I came to see that he didn't see these companies as, as a black box that, that spat out profits at the end of every quarter. He saw them in, 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 in multiple different ways. They were not just a company that provided products that, that people wanted and, and that arguably made their lives better. It also provided work and meaning to thousands of people employed by the company, allowed them to, to support their families. Um, and as, as the one in charge of P&G, he also had to pay attention that, that, to the fact that the company supported thousands upon thousands of retirees who relied on the, the, the um, dividend payments from the stocks uh, to, to kind of keep their lives going. Um, he, he saw many, many dimensions of the companies that he ran, um, including their role in the communities that they served. And I don't think that you find that kind of vision in all corporate leaders. Um, and when you do, I think it's worthy of remembrance. So that's in a large part, what attracted me to this story. So John, I'm gonna stick with you for just another question, Rob. So John talked a little bit about John Smale's commitment to ensuring that P&G maintained the trust of the public. Early in your work, you discovered a really compelling speech he gave on that topic. And you say that he's, he was 30 or 40 years ahead of his time. How did that change how you approached the book? Right, right. So uh, this speech that you're talking about was one of the first documents that Kathy and John shared with me, and, and I don't think that was by accident, John. Um, <laughs> so yes, it was it, in the speech, Smale was describing what today we, we might refer to as stakeholder capitalism, um, kind of this idea that a company has obligations that extend beyond uh, delivering a return to its shareholders. That it can't deliver a return to its shareholders at the expense of treating its employees badly, or at the expense of polluting the environment, or at the expense of exploiting the communities where they do business. Um, and it's important to understand, he was giving this speech in the 1970s. Uh, he delivered it a couple of years after Milton Friedman uh, wrote his, his seminal essay basically describing the be all end all of uh, corporations as shareholder value. Um, so I, I remember checking the date and kind of doing that. I was just thrown the first time I read it by the fact that he was saying that at the time he was saying it. Um, like that summer, the corporate roundtable would come out with a statement essentially repudiating um, the, the shareholder value. Uh, model of capitalism, and I think, as I said in the book, Smell had him by 42 years. Um, but the, that wasn't the only element of the speech that, that I found compelling. Um, just for context, he was talking about um, a, a slate of regulations that the Carter administration was about to apply to various different businesses. Some would affect P&G, some wouldn't. Um, and you know, clearly Smell was not in favor of more regulations on business. Um, so, you know, as a business reporter, I've, I've lost track of the number of speeches I've heard from corporate executives complaining about government regulation. I mean, it, it's just standard. But until I picked up that speech, I don't think I'd ever seen one where the executive was arguing that corporations were overregulated and it was their own fault. 
And I, so I, I had to sit with that for a minute. His argument was that, and to, to get to the, what you were just talking about, John, this is 40 odd years ago, but his point was that businesses in general had lost the trust of the public. And he pointed out in the speech that a lot of the regulations that were being proposed were actually, they were proactive. They were not reactive to something that businesses were doing. They were proactive because of what people were afraid businesses might do. That's the level of mistrust that existed. Um, and the argument he made was really complex. Um, he was, his point was not that businesses ought to, as, as P&G people like to say, do the right thing because it was moral, because it was the correct thing to do, and that was it. It was, it was more nuanced than that. His starting point was that businesses function best when they're regulated the least. And that the only way to lighten the regulatory burden on a business is for businesses in general to establish enough trust with the public um, that they don't feel like this proactive, preemptive regulation is necessary. Um, and that struck me as pretty remarkable. It's not, not, not something I had read or heard articulated before. So that was another element of that speech that I found really, really compelling. Thank you. So I want to talk, consistent with that, and kind of trust in the community, I want to talk for a moment about the role that John Smale and his wife Phyllis played in the community. What advice do you think that John would give leaders today who are thinking about their role in social and environmental issues? Well, I, th I, think, they, uh, I think John would be pretty much saying what you just said, Rob. Uh, that businesses for their own welfare, but in terms of why they exist, have a responsibility to make a difference in the community. One of the things you're going to see when you read this book is how adroitly, I believe, Rob has picked up quotations, things John said from a whole variety of resources and brought them in. And just to pick up on what you were just saying, and this was the speech from 1977. He was president of the company, not yet CEO. And he said, just as you said, Rob, the foundation of a strong corporate structure in America must be based on public trust in the integrity and performance of the business community. All the rhetoric and theory in the world won't do a thing unless business has that trust. And trust is earned by actions. That's all, John. That's John 100%. It's not just words, it's actions. By doing not just what is legal, but what is right. And similarly, a corporation must regard itself as a true citizen of the community in which it operates, pulling its weight to help solve community problems because it knows that the health and welfare of the community are important to its own health and its own welfare. One example of this that I think relates to your question is the role that many of you would know or remember that John played uh, in the Ismail Commission. You know, in one of the not infrequent times when our city was going to hell in a handbasket in terms of its infrastructure, uh, the mayor, Lucan, Charlie Lucan at the time, decided I've got to get a commission to fix the streets and fix the sewers and everything else that needed fixing. And he knew the one person he ought to go to if he was going to collect the business community it was, it was, of course, John. So John took it on, and he'd say with help, and I mean he led this thing personally. I don't know if any of you in the room were involved in that commission. Were you involved? Um, uh, but he called people across the country, the heads of every company, GE, uh, Fifth Third, Kroger, and not one person said no. And that's not surprising. As Charlie Meacham said, Charlie was the head of TAP Broadcasting, nobody would say no to John because they knew where he was coming from. They knew he had a purpose. And they also knew that he'd be making sure it was done right. And that happened. And it was a great success. And Charlie was very confused by John, I think, in the beginning. He thought that John would simply get into the project and hand it off to other people. 
uh, that wasn't the way John worked. If he's into it, it's his baby, and he was at the table and making it happen. That's a great example. There's so many other things that he was involved in. Stop the hate speeches, involved with the in diversity. But Phyllis was very involved too. And there is what, Rob, where is that thing that was built that, uh, somewhere coming into the city that she put together? I can't remember. I think you're talking about what they call the, the anniversary garden. Yeah, um, the, the, she was a great gardener, as some of you would remember. And she wanted to make sure this city was beautiful. And John, of course, devoted to get the start to this male park. And that was in Phyllis's honor. That was in, his, that was in her memory. That's why he started that. And of course, since then, and Kathy really let it. Kathy Kaldemeyer, if she, if she were to see a lot of help, has made that park into what it is today. And I'm glad his name's attached to it. Because I think that's appropriate in terms of signifying his care. Now you have... Hmm. I think something that's interesting to note is that he did not intend to have his name. He what? He did not intend to have his name on that park. He did not? No, Kathy put it there because she thought he deserved it. That he, figure. He, I'm he not surprised. He did not intend to put that, his name on it. That, that figures. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you know, you face the balance between doing social good and why you do it in the business. There's some, some, never any doubt in John's mind that you had to have a healthy business. No doubt. And I wouldn't want anything to color that. You'll see it in the book, and any of you knew, knew that that was absolutely intense. The business had to grow. And he said something once that I'll read to you. Any living company has to have growth. You've got to be able to offer opportunities for people. The whole reason you exist is to produce profits for your shareholders. But fundamentally, you don't start with that. You don't start with that. You start with people who are motivated to accomplish great things. Almost inevitably, that means growth. Whether the great things can be a dinner for us that cuts decay, or disposable diapers, or no matter what it is, that's where growth comes from. So these things went together. And he'd be the first to say a company that's not, that's not successful can't do any social good. That depends on being successful, not just today, but tomorrow and the day after that. But his commitment to this community was, in many ways, I think, akin to, he really is commitment to anything, and that was that it be sustained, that it be perpetuated. And he wanted to, what he could do outside of his work, Cincinnati, to be perpetuated as a city that would be the home to our employees and our headquarters. And might that never change? May it never change in making Cincinnati healthy as a community. And you all know it. There isn't an organization in this town. It doesn't have P&G people, and I'm sure many of you, who are part of making it run. In recent years, uh, David Taylor and others have come up with a new short phrase, which John would really love a force for good and a force for growth. A force for growth and a force for good. And that's really, that, that's a banner people are carrying in PNG today, being a force for growth and a force for good. And I think he'd be so happy with that. So let's turn to growth a little bit. And I'm gonna have another question for you, this time about innovation, a huge passion of John's. Yeah. So he, he knew that P&G was a branding and marketing company, yeah. but he was yeah. really passionate about R&D. He felt like yeah. it was first and foremost an R&D company, and he was a champion of yeah. innovators. Well, I don't need to tell anybody in this room who was with the company about his in-the-blood commitment to innovation. And if he had to start somewhere, it was in the performance of our brands, and it's in technology. He said this, it's important that the people in R&D understand the enormous influence of what they do because it really is everything we do. He referred to a fundamental principle I don't think is going to change and hasn't changed in our history, and that is that we are an R&D-based company. We're a company whose progress and fortunes are based on the success of inventing new brands, new processes that are really distinctive, 
that are market changers and really revolutionize a market when we go into it. Uh, in this book, you will find from Rob many iterations of that. You'll hear from Gordon Brunner and Saki at Arched on this theme. It's irrefutable. Nothing that he believed in more. But I want to expand the innovation a little bit. To say it was really, an, and I learned about, more about this from the book, or at least I, I put it together. His attitude toward innovation, or as I like to say, preserve the core and be prepared to change everything else, that mindset, preserve the core and be prepared to change everything else, uh, applied to everything. It applied to how we dealt with customers. Uh, we wouldn't have the customer business development team, at least not when we did, if it weren't for John. We wouldn't have had product supply bringing together engineering, manufacturing, and purchases. Major monumental change in the design of the way the company operated, if it weren't for John's vision of how we keep innovating and how we run the company. I think his commitment to diversity was incredibly in the area, obviously, of innovation. Seeing the future, we were not doing a good job of recruiting people of color. In the beginning, we weren't doing a good job of recruiting women. Peggy Wyatt, who's here in the front show, and you will see in the book, changed that by becoming the first full-time woman hired into marketing, which is a hard thing to believe in a company that marketed most of its products to women. But he not only talked in every company is talking innovation, right? Everybody, we need more innovation, innovation. He didn't stop in talking about that. He operationalized it. And you'll read about it in the book. How did he operationalize it? Well, many of you were part of it. He put the head of R&D on the board of directors. That had never happened before. He created heads, vice presidents of R&D for each of, the, each of the business divisions. That hadn't happened before. He created a Vic Mills Society to honor people who had, were the best inventors. That hadn't happened before. Again and again, there were systemic, operational things that he did that turned more innovation not into a slogan or just something he believed in deeply, but something that would happen. John's favorite meetings, in my experience, were what we called the Blue Book meetings. The Blue Book meetings. They were the ones where you got together with the R&D folks, and you were sitting around the table, probably on the 11th floor, talking about what new things are coming in products and what new technologies are coming. Oh, he loved that. And later in her career, Peg Wyant was asked by John to figure out what are we going to do in the next, not year, not even the next decade. Peg, what was it, the next 20 or 30 years? The next millennium. Yeah, this was, what, 1980? 79, now what are we going to do in the next millennium? You know, 20, 21 years from now. So Peg came up with a lot of cockamamie ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm all well, kidding aside, some of them are really important. There was a huge emphasis on health care in that. And that, of course, is one word John talked about innovation. John wanted to see us succeed in health care, and it resulted in Norwich which of course we didn't continue in pharmaceuticals, but our, public, our personal healthcare business today, I am told, is the largest of any company over the counter in the world. And God bless up there looking down, he would be so happy to hear that because that was not easy. We had some tough roads to get to that position. But that was part of the innovation of innovation. Now, where, where are our new businesses going to be? Always thinking of that. And we tried some things that didn't work. We went into some businesses like cookies. He would say, you know, we probably should have been more mindful, but we basically we got ripped off by competitors coming in and stealing our patents, and it made it quite a bit harder. Uh, but this innovation is so important today. We all talk about it, but I really emphasize the operationalizing of it and demanding it. This wasn't a question saying we'd like to have better products, could you get us better products? No. He'd say to Wahib Zaki, you're here to get better products. Or Gordon Brunner. And I don't mean just a little bit better. I mean whole category changing. 
I think he'd be very pleased today at the learning going on in Procter & Gamble. I give great credit to David and the whole team. The way we approach customers today is very different than we did when I or when John was the CEO. Today, we're really focused on how we can improve the customer's business. We always wear that by giving them our brands and smart ideas from people. But now we're looking at it, how do we build the category? How do we build category growth? That's a new thing. And every generation has to come up with new things. All the people in businesses, if you're still in one's, got to come up with new things. But everybody is, it's easy to say the words. It's a lot harder to operationalize it. And be consistent, not be trying to do 10 things. Be focused on just a few. Um, but I'm going to start with Rob with some closing words. So you discovered John Smale as you were writing this book. What, if you were going to boil that down to a line or two, what did you discover and why does it matter? I wrote a whole book. My God. I know. You've got to boil it down now, the whole book. John Smale talked a lot about dedicating a working life to a company. And he meant a lot by that. He didn't mean just simply cashing a paycheck for, for 40 years or whatever it was. He believed that the work he and everyone else at P&G did had meaning beyond just whatever the day-to-day -day work they did was. Um, and I've talked about this, the various dimensions uh, on which he saw the company, the various ways it supported other people and community. And, and it was this idea that what you do in life should be in support of something larger than yourself. Um, so that, that is my biggest takeaway from him, is that he believed to his core that he, and, and I think he would, he, he did in fact on multiple occasions describe himself as lucky that he landed where he did um, because he felt that he had a purpose um, and I think he tried to give other people the opportunity to feel that kind of purpose. Um, so I think that's, that's my biggest takeaway. Thank you. John, you've said many amazing things about John Smale tonight. So how would you boil this down? I mean, you gave your heart and soul to this book. The book is called Here Forever. What do you want people to know about the timelessness of John Smale's legacy? Well, you say working on this book, it's been a labor of love is what this has been. Um, what I hope they'll get through the book those who knew him maybe a little bit, those that didn't know him at all. I hope they will get an understanding of what was a unique, a unique life-changing leader um, whose character, uh, whose beliefs, and whose actions were consistent in a remarkable way. The, um, I've had two pictures on my desk now for maybe 20 years, one for 30 or 40. There are two pictures. One is of William Cooper Proctor. I grew up, having learned about Proctor and Gamble, viewing William Cooper Proctor as an icon. That I have on the wall. I have the photograph of John right next to my desk. It's a great photograph of him. And when I face decisions again and again, tough decisions, I look at that photograph and I ask myself, what would John do? What would John have done in this situation? It's hard to be able to convey this man some of you did know him, without having been in the room with him, having observed all the decisions he made. One of the things that most, 
I won't say surprised me, but was an eye-opener in this book for me, even knowing him as well as I did, is the enormous impact he had on the lives of individual people. That they remember today from 20, 25 years ago as if it were yesterday, as life-changing events. Charlotte Otto, Janet Reed, down the list again and again, and you'll read about them. It's amazing. And it didn't just happen yesterday. These are memories. There are memories of interactions. Mark Levy, Sue Telemeyer, was having a baby. She was worried at that time whether you could have a baby and still work. John took her aside and said, you're with friends here. Rob talked about the challenge from Ed to show the whole man, to show the humanistic side. I hope you'll agree with me, I think you will, that Rob succeeded in that goal. The lessons are there, the principles are there, the decisions are there, but I don't think you'll leave this book, that you'll leave that final chapter of this book, which is positively brilliant, if I might say, uh, positively brilliant, without understanding the human side of John Smale, as well as knowing, or at least as I feel, that of all the leaders I've known, and I've known some great ones, I've chaired the board of Walt Disney, chaired the board at Yale, nonprofits, not to mention the P&G leaders that I've been blessed to know, that John is the one, as I say at my forward, who stands tallest because of what he stood for, what he believed, and what he did, and very importantly, by how he made people feel. By how he made people feel. Because I think in the long run, People may remember more than anything, not what you said, not what you did, but how you made them feel. And certainly he made, I think those of us who knew him, feel they were part of something bigger than themselves, as Rob said so well, part of something. We all want to live our lives to a worthy purpose. We've only got one. We want it to be part of something that has a good purpose to it that's surrounded with good values and good people. John was so dedicated to that proposition being made real in Parker and Gamble, and he did it. He did it. I think, what did we say, seven CEOs? Was it seven who learned from John in Parker and Gamble? And then you'll have, and you'll see the endorsements in the book from Paul Pullman, who left to go to Unilever, Chip Berg, many other leaders who grew up, who remember 20, 25, 30 years ago, the influence John had on them as they were growing up. And there'd be countless more who would say the same thing. So there's a lot here. I hope you'll read the book fully and I hope you'll share it with your friends because of the dedication now is to get this out and benefiting other people. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. It was a really stimulating conversation. That's one of the best parts of being in the PNG Alumni Network. We have books for sale, and both John and Rob have graciously agreed to sign them if you want to chat with them or get a book signed over there. Um, and there's also a website, which is johnsmailhereforever.com. And we thank you all for coming. Have a great night.